Hi, my name is Frank Lake. I'm a USDA Forest Service research ecologist with the Pacific Southwest Research Station Fire and Fuels Program. My research involves traditional ecological knowledge in ethnobotany and biology, in particular looking at fire effects and climate change impacts to tribally valued habitats and resources. On the management, I also serve as a resource advisor on wildfires and other interdisciplinary assignments. Today I would like to talk with you and share my research and management experience working with Northwest California tribes and we'll focus on common tribal cultural uses of fire in Northwest California with acorns and hazelnut for basketry stems. In this presentation, I'll be addressing what information is useful and needed on tribal fire management and cultural burning objectives for well-timed and well-planned burning that meet specific objectives. What information do fire and resource managers need to work with landowners and tribes to plan and successfully implement prescribed cultural burns? Information on cultural burning, I'll be looking at two different case study examples with a goal to provide information for two of the most important cultural uses of prescribed fire in the region and to give background on why tribal members use fire to manage those resources. Provide details for each cultural burn example regarding fire specifics for operations and implementation for evaluating fire effects to determine if objectives were accomplished. Regarding the timing of burn, what are the best windows for burning, and how do you know when the timing is right based on those cultural indicators? What clues do you look for in the field related to prescriptions and environmental parameters for meeting your objectives? And for fire effects, how do you know you've met those objectives, in particular, from the, the resource quality post burn, and what other considerations, such as fire return levels for burning or other items of importance, should we consider? And a lot of this work has been built upon and, and has come from my research and management with the Yurok and the Karut tribe in northwestern California, as well as a growing body of other scientists and land and resource managers who are convening for collaborative restoration projects. In particular, the Fire State Council burns, as well as the Nature Conservancy Training Exchange, or TREX burns. Regarding partnerships with American Indian tribes, so that the first and foremost importance of my research is to respect and honor that indigenous knowledge and thinking about the way to reinstate cultural burning, both for tribes and for broader society, with the goal of restoration of landscapes and cultural practices, looking at the eco-cultural restoration for ecosystems of human health. And through these partnerships, integrate landscape restoration strategies with tribal traditional ecological knowledge and associated stewardship practices, in particular to identify current and former orchards or those most productive groves and areas that would require or need more intensive tending and stewardship. This is an active form of restoration and for tribes, eco-cultural revitalization, particularly with fire and desired quality of those resources and cultural practices and knowledge systems. We may and need to consider how to evaluate whether tribal resources are available in the desired quantity and quality. And through that, we can identify and understand what common metrics and indicators are useful and how do we promote conservation and tribally valued wildlife in the process of our cultural prescribed burning. Example one is a tan oak, California black oak within that mixed Douglas fir, mixed conifer hardwood forest type found in the North Coast Range in the Western Klamath Mountains. The objective here is really looking at the acorn quality for food. Acorns from both tan oak as well as California black oak were historically and are still some of the main food resources of Northern California tribes. The objectives for cultural burning in this forest type are to improve access to suitable large, older oak trees or stands, many of those being orchards who have had tribal stewardship for hundreds of years, not even thousands of years in some cases. By reducing the acorn pests, such as the filbert weevil and the moth, which infest the acorn and basically render it as a poor quality or inedible, and to increase the efficiency of gathering higher quality acorns and by reducing the understory surface and ladder fields to maintain wide open understory spaces between those oak trees within those orchards. For the season of burn and the objectives, although some of these objectives can be achieved with spring, early summer burning, most tribes burn in the fall, coinciding with the start of the good acorn dropping. Generally, trees will drop infertile or buggy acorns in the late summer. And then followed by that, you have the start of the brown top 
bad acorns, which are usually have visible signs of holes or other marks or defects. And then the healthier white top, good acorns start to fall. You know, at this time, around late September or early October, that transition from the infertile and buggy brown top acorns to then the white top good, that top burning under oak trees was conducted by tribes and still is. This was generally after the first rain and after a few days of warm weather where the surface and litter and fuels are dry enough to carry fire. And even though good acorns, such as the middle picture here, may fall, they can still be affected by, in this case, this adult weevil, piercing and boring into that acorn. And a lot of these indicators and the way to evaluate this is learned by being out with tribal elders and practitioners regarding the quality of acorns across different locations. In regards to the oak tree and acorn pest life history cycle, this work has been developed by Kat Anderson, retired NRCS ethnobotanist, looking at the life cycle of these pests in relation to the oaks. Spring burns may achieve some of that, but generally not as much because of the moisture in the life history stage of those pests still within the litter or a dust. Whereas a fall burn, that targets and can actually hit two cohorts or two age classes of the insects, both the weevil and the moth, because you have in the fall time the adults laying eggs, and then you have the juveniles from the year prior who are getting ready to overwinter. Both trees, tan oak and black oak, have a two-year acorn development life cycle, being pollinated in the spring and then the second fall dropping. And the bugs also have a two-year life cycle. And so when you burn again in the fall time, you can hit the adults and then the year younger age class before they go to overwinter. When we think about emission patterns in tan oak forest, they generally are adapted to the topography the fuel continuity or load and the density of trees. The site to be burned ideally has already had the majority of the ladder fuels and understory smaller trees and brush thinned, and the generated fuel disposes either by burn piles or by chipping. The consideration of doing pullback of surface litter from the base of larger trees, especially in front of the trunk cavity, can help prevent hot cavity fires, which can further structurally or even lethally kill the tree. We see the top picture here. You see the spring-June research burn, and you see some of the pullback fuels at the base of those trees where those weren't ignited around. And then the same site in the lower, bigger picture, showing Yurok and Karuk igniters burning during the Klamath River treks around those same trees, but then doing tree-centered firing where they're doing a circular fire around that as well as doing their ignition strips. So these backing fires start at the top or the highest elevation of the unit with igniters burning strips about 20 to 25 feet apart on flatter ground closer on steeper areas, again, with that point center firing around and out from the base of the larger oak trees. This ignition strategy has converging flame fronts, about one to eight feet tall, near the outer drip lines of most oaks, reducing the amount of heat and scorch near the trunk and up through the center canopy of those larger trees. In this example, this was traditional burning in a modern context to achieve a range of multiple objectives, such as reduction of hazardous fuels in the wildland urban interface, along that egress road access route between neighbors for a research burn, as well as to reinstate access to this area for traditional food gathering of acorns. And environmental parameters and then burn conditions we consider for burn time are generally warm air temperatures between 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, relative humidity from 20 to 40 percent, winds in any direction but light and variable from one to eight miles per hour, with that 10-hour fuel stick ranging between 7 to 15% moisture, depending upon the desired level of burn consumption and charged woody material remaining after the burn. In some cultural burns, tribes will take rotten limbs and smaller logs up to 10 inches in diameter and make long, snaky, loose piles along the drip lines out away from the trees. These limbs are generally burned up during the ignition and the burn across the site, but some logs can remain smoldering after the burn, and that practice or belief is that the fumigate insects in the canopy overnight, although this practice may violate many of the current air quality district smoke emission regulations, and so that should be considered and thought of. For fire effects and for post-burn conditions, desired fire effects are 70 to 90 percent of scorch or mortality of the ladder fuels with smaller trees up to three inches in diameter and brush, 75 to 90 percent removal or consumption of the surface fuels, those needles, leaves, and small twigs, 20 to 30 percent of the dust across the area burned down the bare mineral soil, especially under the larger oaks where acorns will be gathered. And this condition reduces the suitable habitat for those weevils and mobs 
seeking new acorns to insect on the ground or for overwintering down in the soil and the dust. After the burn, you should be able to have or start with the timing right, those white top good acorns dropping onto recently charred burn understory ground surface that are easily gathered and are less susceptible to adult and larva insect pests because most of those were burned up in a prior fire. And now those insects also have a less than optimal litter or dust to overwinter in, which prevents their infestation of the current season as well as next year's acorns because you've reduced that population of those insects. When we think about acorns and the burn frequency and for food quality, there's some other things to consider here. With recent Fire States Council and the Trex for Train Exchange burns, and these oak-dominated forest types reveal a desired fire return interval or frequency of about five years, just frequent enough to consume the smaller dead trees and brush from the prior fire and the accumulated litter, but also giving about one to three year flexibility for burn windows, resource availability, and any other fall weather events that may prevent burning that year, trying to do it the next year will be ideal. Other considerations for creating fire cavities in some younger trees and to reduce the rotten punky wood in existing older tree cavities to support wildlife habitat. Although again, about my point before about the tree-centered ignition and point protection, have caution or take caution for initial cavity fires that can structurally weaken or thermally girdle and kill those trees. They'll need some kind of mop-up, their mop-up some protection to extinguish those cavity fires. And the suggestions, invite tribal acorn harvesters to participate in the planning and implementation of burns, and then to come back and gather acorns post-burn to see how both manager, resource manager, and trial practitioner can align our understanding, our knowledge, and share what's been learned from that prescribed burn. The second example is looking at California beak hazel, which is an important basket tree and food resource, primarily within the California black oak or Oregon white oak forest type. The objectives for burning in this forest type are to improve access to hazel bushes, to reduce the same net pests that affect acorns, the filbert weevil and moth, to increase the efficiency of gathering higher quality, straight, branchless stems or shoots for basketry two years after the burn, and then with that, hazelnuts four to seven years after the burn. And then by reducing the understory surface and ladder fuels. Although some of these objectives can be achieved with spring or early summer burning, most tribes burned in the late summer, early fall, coinciding with the ending of the hazelnut harvesting. Burn objectives in addition to be considered, generally hazel bushes drop to infertile and buggy nuts in the late summer. And around that time, late August or September into October, cultural burning in hazel-dominated patches was and is conducted by tribes. This was or is generally after a rain and after a few days of warm weather where the surface litter and fuels are dry enough to carry fire. The ignition patterns are adapted to the topography, the fuel continuity, and density of trees or hazelnut bushes. And ideally, the site to be burned has already had the majority of the latter fuels and the understory smaller trees and non-hazel bushes thinned and that generated fuel disposed by burn piles or chipping, although in some cases, maybe there's going to be treatments along the edge of the unit, and then you modify your ignition strategies in the center where you have untreated or not having had the fuels reduction completed yet. For burning patterns and ignitions, stacking fires starting at the top of the highest elevation of the unit with burners igniting strips about 10 to 15 feet apart on flatter ground or closer on steeper areas, with point-centered firing around and between the bases of the larger hazelnut bushes. Again, lighting around the hazelnut bushes and having that fire back into it, particularly if you're using drip torch fuel, is one way to avoid getting that fuel on the bush that's of cultural food and basketry importance. This ignition strategy has converging flame fronts about one to eight feet high or tall among most of the hazel bushes, resulting in a scorch of the leaves and killing most of those stems. For environmental parameters, particularly for hazel, looking at warm air temperatures between 55 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, relative humidity from about 15 to 30 percent, winds light and variable, but one to eight miles per hour. For a 10-hour fuel stick, ranging between seven to 15 percent moisture, depending upon desired level of burn consumption and charred woody material remaining after the burn. And then for desired fire effects, looking to have about 70 to 90 percent of scorch or mortality of those latter fuels the smaller trees up to three inches in diameter of the brush, even including the hazel, being scorched or killed. 70 to 90 percent removal or consumption of the surface fuels. 10 to 25 percent of the dust of the area burned down to bare mineral soil. And then after the burn, the majority of the hazel bushes are scorched, having consumed most of the leaves. And you'll be using an indicator 
of looking for brown, charred, and blistering on those lower stems at the ground surface level. For post-fire desired conditions, particularly for the shoots, for basketry, and, the, and then for the nuts for food, about 18 months after or the second spring following the fall burn, new straight shoot, hazel shoots will be pruned for basketry. Also, any of those shoots that have been browsed by deer, elk, other ungulates or wildlife, those are left behind. And that side pruning, whether herbivory or pruning for basketry shoots, foster side branching, and that can facilitate nut production starting in the third or fourth year after the burn. And generally, you see a gradient where a more closed canopy forest type will have longer, straighter shoots. And as you get into more of a southern aspect or more open forest understory, more light condition, you'll have more branching and generally more nut production. So it's that fine gradient kind of between the black oak, more closed forest, into that Oregon white oak, more open southern aspect prairie system that you'll have more of the nut production for burning in, in this way. For burn frequencies and for tribal engagement, the recent Fire Safe Council and with Trex burns and these oak hazel dominated forest types reveal desired fire return interval or frequency of about seven to 10 years, just frequent enough to allow for two to three years of nut production and then the burn again to consume the prior fire killed small trees and brush from the prior fire and that accumulated litter since then. And it also gives some flexibility for a one to three year window for resource availability, the burn window, and weather events. Other considerations are to use alternate ignition sources such as propane or pitch sticks rather than drip torch fuel in and around these areas because of the food and other basketry interests. And particularly if you're burning under cooler conditions, not all that drip torch fuel will be volatilized and can remain on the site and that can be a hindrance to, to the quality. Suggestions. Invite tribal basket weavers to participate in the planning of and with conducting the burns, and then to gather shoots and the nuts following the burn, and then evaluate the different or even multiple treatments in the same area over years. I provided here some resources and other useful information, publications looking at the integration of traditional and Western knowledge for forest landscape restoration, another journal article looking at returning fire to the land, celebrating traditional knowledge and fire. Dissertation research looking at the season of burn on tan oak. Work done with a research team around restoring California black oak ecosystems to promote tribal values and wildlife. And some other reports on fire and cultural resources in oaks. For the web-based material, features some of the information, particularly working with the fire adapted communities and talking about reinstating cultural burns, fire and agroforestry related to tribal communities and cultural burning the Climate Server Trex videos, and then the Europe Cultural Fire Management Council, and the Nature Conservancy's Indigenous People's Burning Network. For additional information, please contact me, Frank Lake, USDA Forest Service, and I would like to acknowledge the Karuk Tribe, Karuk Indigenous Basket Weavers, the Yurok Tribe, Yurok Cultural Fire Management Council, for their contribution of indigenous fire knowledge for research and for management with the US Forest Service, and in working with the local Fire Safe Council and others on our collaborative landscape restoration projects. And also, I might add and be transparent, some of the tribal community members felt like such a product as this should be developed by the tribes. But again, in my capacity as a forest service research scientist and of being a, a tribal descendant from the area, I'm integrating both cultural and my professional academic knowledge here for this presentation. This project was funded through USDA Western Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education Project coordinated by University of California Cooperative Extension, and then is based upon long-time research, cooperative research and wildland fire management among the research station, the Forest Service, the Orleans Stones Bar Fire Safe Council, Karuk Indigenous Basket Weavers, the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network, Yurok Cultural Fire Management Council, the Karuk and Yurok Tribe, and the Six Rivers National Forest, Orleans Ranger District, who have been conducting cultural prescribed burns and working together, and will continue so. Thank you.